Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's a long walk from the wings out here. But uh, I, I got to, well, first of all, Don, I want to say thank you to you and Judy for having such a lovely dinner for me tonight. They made vegetarian lasagna, and I appreciate that very much. It was wonderful. I knew I was at uh, Ball State University because when they handed me my iced tea, it was in a ball jar. So uh, I always want to get a little publicity there. You know, uh, I really have got to make a comment about the, before I get started, about the power and the influence of television. It's, it's absolutely awesome sometimes. I know that uh, Don mentioned Gunsmoke. Do you realize that I started Gunsmoke in 1955? That was almost before television started. And uh, I was on the show for nine years, so the last gun smoke I did was in 1964. Now, you mathematicians can figure that was 28 years ago. 28 years ago was the last time I was on gun smoke. And yet, today, when I got off the airplane, I always stick my head in the cockpit and say thanks to the pilot for getting me down safely. You know, he didn't even say hello or how are you or anything. He just said, what happened to your stiff leg? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to tell you, you can't believe how quickly that leg healed once they stopped paying me. <laughs> Automatic. I just, I, it's such a privilege for me to be here, and I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of uh, this week, Universe City. I think it's an absolutely wonderful concept, and I appreciate it so much. And I think the theme of this week's, uh, what would you call it, uh, Universe City, if you will, is so wonderful and so right on. Touching home. Oh, I love that, because you know, a home is such a necessary and natural environment for we human beings. Uh, of course, it has to be a loving home. It has to be one that's productive. It has to be a home where we can share our innermost feelings and feel safe about it. Uh, it has to be a place uh, where we can discuss our, our interests and our hopes and our dreams and also our victories and our defeats. That's what a home should be. So you know the expression, a house is not a home? That's absolutely true. A home is something more than just a structure or just a building. It's a, it's a feeling, really. It's a feeling of love. It's a, it's a feeling of, uh, uh, of, of security and assurance that we get from it. It's, it's just so important to us. It's, it's not a place. And I just want to tell you that it can be a club, it can be a church, it can be, it doesn't have to be that place where the immediate family lives. It can be a college, it can be a university. And for me, coming here today, I just want to let you know that you made me feel like I touched a little bit of my home because you made me feel real good and I thank you for it. Uh, I also want to say that a home is, is really synonymous with family. Do you ever think about why we were put in that, that family unit, why we were put into that structure? I believe that one of the most important reasons for us being in a family is so that we can begin to think past the little self, to think of ourselves as being something or a part of something that is larger than ourselves, so that we can expand our consciousness, if you will, and realize that we are part of a larger consciousness. And it's also uh, a place where we can exercise what I feel is one of the greatest gifts that our Creator has given us, and that's our ability to love and to be loved. And that's what we can do in our home and that's what we can do in our family. And you know, we also realize that love is something that we all want extremely, uh, want it badly. 
that it is really something that is we can't do without, and if we do, life becomes meaningless for us. And we realize that to keep that love, which is so important to us, is a real paradox, is a real irony there. To keep love, you got to give it away. And that's what you can learn at home. That's what you can learn in the family. That's what you can learn any place that you live, in any relationship that you have. To keep the love ourselves, we've got to give it away. Isn't that interesting that the more you give it, the more you keep it. As a matter of fact, it's impossible to give it away because it comes right back to us. So the family is an extremely important part of our lives, but we've got to begin to think past the immediate family, past the mother, the father, and the, simbli and the siblings. We've got to start thinking about the family as an extended family. This university is a family. Our community must become a family. Our country must become a family, the whole world. In other words, we must expand that consciousness of family until it includes every person upon this planet until we realize that we are all one, are part of one big human family and to treat each other with that same love and respect that we treat our immediate family. But you know, there's a, there's a phrase now which is rather popular. It's called uh, a dysfunctional family. And that, of course, is a family where love is not the base, where there is not a sense of oneness in that family, where that doesn't exist. And in a dysfunctional family, of course, there's always uh, an element of jealousy, an element of uh, sometimes hate, sometimes greed, sometimes shame, sometimes doubt, fear. It's, in, it, there's a, it's a family that is out of balance. And you know, that consciousness of hate, that consciousness of greed, those negative things also expands away from us and out from us. And what has happened is that this earth family of which we are all a part has become a dysfunctional family, if you will. There's greed that permeates it and hate and fear. And so the result of those emotions we see that the world is filled with poverty, with disease, with a, a degradation of our environment. It's filled with continuous wars. One war just breeds another war. And we see our brothers and sisters around the world killing each other. This is not the way that a family was meant to be. So we have got to begin to heal this dysfunctional earth family that we are all a part of. And to heal that family, we must first heal the immediate family because the earth family is just made up of those parts. And to heal that immediate family, we've got to begin where? You know it and I know it. And that's with ourselves. We've got to begin to heal myself, and you've got to begin to heal yourself. And we've got to come from a position of understanding, of cooperation, and of love. That is absolutely essential. And if we do that, we can heal all of the problems that we have on this earth, whether they be social problems or political problems or environmental problems. They will all begin to disappear when we begin to heal ourselves and to heal our immediate family and then subsequently to heal this earth family. You know, we talk a lot about the environment and the problems with the environment, and we, we've got to heal the planet. Uh, but when we talk about that, what are we mostly talking about? We're talking about things outside of ourselves. We're talking about stopping the depletion of the ozone layer, which allows life to exist upon this planet. Or we're talking about uh, doing something to stop global warming or to eliminate acid rain or deforestation or desertification, all of these problems that we have created. We talk about stopping them, healing them. But you know something? That's outside of us. And what we really should be working on 
is not necessarily the outer environment, but our inner environment. Because if we have an inner environment that is polluted, it will make the outer environment polluted as well. Because what we are inside, we automatically reflect outwardly. If we're carrying around in ourselves, in our consciousness, hate or greed or fear or prejudice or all of these negative things, those emotions will direct our actions and we will make this world a reflection of what we are within. And that's what we have done. There was one great sage that said, Utopia must spring in the private bosom before it can flower into civic virtue. In other words, it all starts within. It all starts within each and every one of us. So we've got to look to ourselves and say, I'm going to be responsible for what I am. I am going to start feeling a different way and have a different attitude towards those I meet during my daily activity. And I'm going to give them a smile and I'm going to give them a little love and I'm going to give them a little encouragement. And you just see what happens in your sphere of activity. Now, there's another thing I'd like to bring up. And a lot of these things that I bring up tonight, hey, listen, I know you, you may not agree with them, but that's not the point. The point is, let us begin to think, and, and hopefully I will trigger some kind of curiosity within you, and you will begin to think about something a little bit differently, and maybe come to some other conclusions than you have carried before. Uh, Do you ever think how, how similar that this body of ours is to the earth itself. It's made up practically of the same elements and to the same proportions almost, like the earth is 80% water, so is our body. And you go down the other elements and they're proportionally the same. They're very similar. They're both living organisms and both of them have a will to live. Every living organism in this world has a will to live. As Schweitzer said, I, I, uh, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> I am that which wills to live. I am life which wills to live in the midst of life that wills, wills to live. We all have that urge to survive, every living organism. And the earth is no different, and our own body is no different. They both have immune systems, and they both can heal themselves if given an opportunity. Look at all of the abuse that we can put upon this body, and yet it's resilient, it comes back. And we do that all the time. And we can put a lot of poison into it, but there comes a point when there is a, a point of no return when it is irreversible, when the body will not take any more poison and the immune system shuts down. And when the immune system collapses, what happens? We die. That's the end of it. Well, we are so similar to this earth. Isn't it reasonable to ask the same question? How much poison can we put into this earth? How much abuse can we give it? before its immune system shuts down, before it reaches that point of no return and it dies? Well, I got to tell you, that's not going to happen because this earth has a tremendously strong immune system and it will keep on going long after we're gone. This is not a fragile earth. This is a very strong earth. So it will be here. But you know, just as our body will try to get rid of that which is trying to destroy it, so this earth will also try to get rid of, and this is a natural law, that which is trying to destroy it, and we are that which is trying to destroy it. So, as my friend Ed Begley Jr. always says, we don't have to worry about saving the earth. What we have to worry about is saving our own ass. 
because the earth will create, according to natural law, an environment which does not support human life. And that's what we're doing right now. We're destroying our life supports, the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, and the soil that grows our food. So we've got to make some changes. You know, you might ask, well, how did we get into this, this mess that we're in environmentally? Well, it took a long time. It's happened very slowly over a long period of years. And that's one of the problems, because we haven't really seen it coming on. It's been very, very gradual. And you know, we as human beings, we really act out of crisis and not out of uh, a goal by objective. Crisis. You know, we're extremely good at dealing with a, a hurricane when it comes, or a tornado, or a volcano, or an earthquake, or famine. All of these things, when we can see the crisis in front of us, and we can see the tragedy and see the problems, we roll up our sleeves and we take action and we get the job done. But when it comes on us slowly, we seem to have trouble having the vision to see it down the line and head it off at the pass, so to speak. It reminds me of the story of the frog. You remember that experiment they did with the frog? Most of you don't remember that experiment they did with the frog. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you about it. They put this frog in a container of water, you see, and it was arranged so that the frog could get out if it felt like it needed to get out if there was a reason to get out. But there was no reason to get out. It swam around in the water and was fed food and it was very happy. It was in its environment. But then the scientists began to heat the water, but very, very slowly. So slowly that the frog didn't even realize that the water was being heated. Until one day, it just kept adjusting and adjusting and adjusting and staying in there until one day the frog said to itself, my God, I'm in real hot water. <laughs> but you know, by that time it was so innervated it didn't have the strength to save itself. We human beings are in somewhat the same position. Are we going to keep adjusting and adjusting and adjusting and putting blinders on and sticking our head in the sand like an ostrich until one day we say, oh, God, I'm in real hot water, but by that time we don't have the money, the time, or the energy to save ourselves? That's the question that we must answer now. You know, Albert Schweitzer, I have great admiration for Dr. Schweitzer, he pinpointed the problem, I think, more clearly than anybody else when he said that the disastrous feature of our civilization is that it has developed more materially than it has spiritually. Its balance is disturbed, and a civilization that develops only on the material side and not on the sp in the spiritual sphere heads for disaster. Now, what do you think he meant by developing spiritually? Well, certainly I don't think he meant just simply that we should uh, all join an organization or a church or a temple or a synagogue or, or that sort of thing, put our name on, the, on a membership list. That doesn't change us any. And that hasn't helped in the past. I think what he was trying to suggest to us that we are basically spiritual beings, that we are threefold in nature, that we are body, mind, and spirit, but the spirit is the most important part. And that's the part that we've neglected. That's the part that we've ignored. We've taken care of a lot uh, of, uh, in terms of the, the body and the mind. But that spiritual part of us, that we really haven't
taken care of. Now you see this, we have a body, there's no question about that. But just think how quickly the body goes. The body is transient, the body passes away, but deep within each and every one of us is an unchanging state of consciousness that always was, it always will be, and the nature of that consciousness is peace and love and joy and contentment and assurance and security and tremendous fulfillment. And that is within each and every one of us, and each and every one of us has the capacity to know it in a direct, in a personal way. Not in theory, not in imagination, not in idea. But that is contactable right within each and every one of us. It doesn't make any difference what part we're playing in this uh, cosmic drama, if you will. I like to call it God's great soap opera. It doesn't matter whether we're male or female, black, white, rich, poor, any of those things. We're all alike in that sense. We're all equal in that sense that we all have that center within us that is peaceful, that is loving, and that is joyful. It's like one, one saint said, you know, we're carrying around this portable heaven and we're living in ignorance of it. We don't even know it's there. It's covered up with all kinds of negative emotions, with attachments and with desires and all of these things that are related to the world. It's that consciousness that we are all seeking, believe me, either directly or indirectly in everything that we do. Now the world, of course, <laughs> is very strong. It's a very strong force. And it will say, I can satisfy you. What is it you want? Power? Come over here, I'll give it to you. You want money? Come over here, I'll give it to you. You want sex? Come over here, I'll give it to you. Whatever it is, it offers it. But you, you know, it's a strange thing. We get those things and we realize shortly after that they're not as appealing as we thought they would be. There's still something that is missing. There's something that it doesn't make it complete. What we're looking for is a kind of lasting fulfillment. Well, how can we get something lasting out of something that is temporary? There is nothing that is lasting in this world. But it keeps making us think that that's where we're going to get it. And so we spend all this time, all this energy doing it. And every time, every time, the rug is pulled out from under us. Now that's something else that we're looking for. Oddly enough, and sadly enough, is right within ourselves. It's so close, you can't see the forest for the trees. It's like, I love that story about the musk deer. You remember the story about the musk deer? <laughs> Most of you don't remember the story about the musk deer. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you the story about the musk deer. The musk deer lives in the Himalayas. And at a certain age, this wonderful, excruciating, satisfying, fulfilling fragrance oozes out of its navel. And it intoxicates the poor deer. And the poor deer says, oh, that's heavenly. I want some more of that. Let me find the source of that. And it runs behind the rock sniffing, and it runs behind the trees sniffing, and it runs into the grass sniffing, and it goes hither and yon, and it pretty soon it just gets so frantic it can't find it any place, and it jumps over the cliff and destroys itself, looking outside of itself for that which is right within itself. And you know something? We humans make the very same mistake, looking always outside of ourselves for that fulfilling consciousness, that peace that passeth all understanding, as Christ said, that is right within each and every one of us. So to grow spiritually, as Schweitzer said, is to make contact with that and know it in a real, personal, and tangible way. And also to understand that we are all connected 
in the one consciousness of our Creator. All connected. And that includes not only you and me, but it includes the plants, it includes the animals, it includes this earth ourselves. We are connected to it irrevocably. We cannot live without it. It's our mother, if you will. You know, as Chief Seattle said, man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. And whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. So, you know, somebody asked me once if I was an environmentalist, and I said, well, of course I'm an environmentalist, but so are you. And I would point out that so are you and you and you. Everybody on the planet is an environmentalist in that every thought that we think, every action that we take impacts the world that we live in and makes it what it is. So it's not a question of whether we're an environmentalist or not. That's a given. The only question is, are we a good one or are we a bad one? Are we going to leave this earth that our children, our grandchildren, their children and theirs can enjoy it as we have enjoyed it? Or are we going to continue to destroy it? This is the most exciting time in the evolution of the human species, but it's also the most dangerous because we are in charge. But you know, there's great hope because I see that happening. I see that spirituality growing. I see that great shift in human consciousness, if you will, away from the material and towards the spiritual. And that's what will solve every problem that we have, believe me. Because when we feel that consciousness within, what is the spiritual law? The spiritual law says that we give it to somebody else. You cannot hold it for yourself. Wouldn't this be a wonderful world if people felt that love within them, felt that peace within them, felt that joy, and then started giving it to those around them, and they would give it to others, and they would give it to others? The world would change overnight. Just remember, there is no lasting peace, there is no lasting solution to any of our problems until the hearts of people are changed. And I say that all the time, and people say, yes, Brother Weaver, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like a preacher. You know, some, anyway, some people call me that too. But anyway, I feel it deeply that they'll, they'll say, yes, I understand. I understand the hearts of people have got to be changed. And I'm going out there and I'm going to change her heart. And I'm going to change his heart. And that's such a futile effort. There's only one heart that we can do anything about, and that's our own. But when we change our own, we will begin to change thousands because we become an environmental force on those people that we come in contact with. Love and cooperation, they're no longer an option in this world today. It's too dangerous. They're an absolute necessity. And believe me, Think about this. We will either come to the understanding that we are individualized parts of the one whole and that our own well-being depends upon the well-being of the whole or we will, out of ignorance, continue to believe that we are separate, that we can bring benefit to ourselves while we damage others, and in holding on to that belief, we will simply eventually destroy ourselves. We will either learn to love or we will perish. You know, there's an old Chinese proverb that says, if we don't alter our course, we're going to wind up where we're headed. <laughs> The world of where we're headed is pretty bleak. It's pretty disastrous. But the thing is, we can alter our course. We have that power. Don't ever underestimate the power that you have because you have the power to think. And everything comes from thought. We have been given this beautiful thing called common sense and reason 
and free will and the power to choose. So we are the creators on this planet. We have created everything. Of course, we were given that creative power by the one creator. There's no question about that. The one creator says, I give you the power of free will. I give you the power of free choice. And I give you this planet. It's yours. It's your playground. Do with it what you will, but if you mess up, I will not throw you a lifeline. I will not interfere, because to interfere would be to rescind my law of free choice, and I will not do that. I have made you free human beings. So, we have be been given dominion over all things. There's no question about that, and there's, that's a great power. Do you realize what a responsibility goes with that? We have been given dominion over all things. But that doesn't mean that we use that power to destroy the very things that we have been given dominion over. No, it means that we must use it responsibly. We must use it not to destroy, but to save and to preserve that which we have been given, been given dominion over. We are the custodians of this planet. We are the stewards. We are the creators because we can have an idea. And you realize that an idea is the beginning of the creative process? There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that has ever been created. And that includes uh, the chairs that you're sitting in, this microphone, the clothes I'm wearing, the cars that we drive. Nothing. This whole universe city, if you will, first started as an idea in somebody's mind. And then they gathered other people with the same idea, and the energy grew. And out of that energy and out of that idea came action. And lo and behold, it becomes manifest into materialization. So, just remember that an idea is the beginning, but an idea without action is a dead idea. And an idea, if it's to be fruitful and productive, must be based on love. It must be something that benefits those that are in this human family with us. So yes, we're responsible for everything that we see. We're responsible for the condition of the earth. We have created it through our thoughts and through our actions. But we also have the power, if we see something out there that is wrong, that needs correcting, we have the power to uncreate and to recreate. That's how powerful we are. So we must hold the vision of the world that we want, though a world that is free from all of those negative things like greed and fear and prejudice. And we must create a world that is truly based upon cooperation and understanding and tolerance and justice. It's like James Allen said, said, dreams are the seedlings of realities. So never underestimate the power of a visualization or a dream. And as the, the peace pilgrim said, this is not the darkness before the storm. This is the darkness before the dawn of the golden age of peace, true peace, lasting peace. So let us see if we can't light our candle of love and cooperation that others might light theirs off of ours and hold this vision, if you will, candle after candle after candle being lit, sweeping across this world like a great prairie fire, pushed forward by the winds of love and cooperation and understanding and tolerance burning away all hate, bigotry, prejudice, and leaving in its wake a world at peace, a world that is productive, a world where we can all feel safe and secure, where we can all live in harmony with our one mother, this earth. 
It's, a, it's not an easy task, but it's a task that we can do. We've got to start with ourselves. It's going to take commitment. Now, it's going to take more than just kind of hearing a lecture and getting kind of jacked up and aroused. And that's, that's being involved, but it's got to go past involvement. It's got to really, you got to really be committed to it. You know, there's a great difference between involvement and, and commitment. Let me explain it to you this way. You see, you take a breakfast of ham and eggs. It's hard for me to do that because I'm a vegetarian. But <laughs> you take a breakfast of ham and eggs. For you to have that breakfast, obviously the chicken was involved. But it was the pig that was committed. <laughs> so that's what we've got to be willing to do is lay it right on the line. Say, the buck stops here. I'm going to do my part. I had a vision the other day, and it came out in the form of a poem, and I'm going to end with this, uh, with this poem. And it goes like this. I saw an eagle in the sky today, flying free upon the wind. In my dreams, I touched its wings, caught the wind, and flew with him. Oh, what glory it was for me flying free up in the sky, for dreams become realities if in our souls they never die. So face the moment when you're down, for your eagle lives within. Hold the vision of your truth. Dream your eagle and fly with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody, I don't know, I'm open for questions if you, if you want that. Well, I guess I answered them all. <laughs> yeah. Any contradiction in that myself we certainly are part of the whole there's no question about that and whatever happens to the whole has an effect upon us and whatever we do to the whole has an effect upon the whole but we have free choice and free will to take the kind of actions that can affect the whole more than the whole can affect us if you will so I, I you know I don't see any real contradiction there so those weren't my words anyway. If, they, if you have a problem with them, talk to Chief Seattle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this on? Oh. See, the miracles of, uh, of the uh, electronic age, I guess. The question was, did I ever finish building my houses made out of garbage? Uh, that's the way a lot of people put it, but actually basic building materials are 
old used automobile tires and aluminum cans? The answer is yes, I finished it. We've been living in it uh, over two years now, and it is working absolutely beautifully. I wouldn't live anyplace else. The favorite house I've ever been in. Uh, for those of you who don't know about it, actually it's being shown on, I've made a film about the uh, building of the house. It's being shown on PBS right now in different stations, different cities throughout the, the country, but it's a solar mass house. And of course, most people understand what a solar house is. We have photovoltaic cells that collects the sun's energy, converts that energy into electricity, and then we store that electricity in batteries and use it to power all the appliances in the house. That includes our dishwasher, uh, refrigerator, freezer, everything except the stove, which is propane, hair dryers, shavers, everything is powered from that one clean source, which is also inexhaustible, and that's the sun's energy. Now, the mass part of it is really the more, most interesting part, uh, did you say I'm off? <laughs> the mass uh, has the ability to store temperature or to store energy. And the more mass you have in the house, the more it's like a cave, if you will. Cave stays cool in the summertime and warm in the wintertime because of this tremendous mass around it. You go down in a cave far enough and the temperature will never vary. It'll be like 56 or 58, something like that, degrees. And so we took that principle and utilized it in the house. What we did is we took these old used automobile tires and rammed them full of dirt, packed it in there so tight that the tires actually swell, and they become tire bricks, really. And then we use these huge tire bricks that weigh about 400 pounds a piece after we fill them with dirt. Uh, just like you would ordinary bricks, to build the walls of the house. Every living space in the house is surrounded by these tire bricks, which create a tremendous amount of mass. So we don't have to have in our house any uh, heating ducts or any air conditioning. And it gets down to 30 below out there in Colorado at 7,200 feet in the wintertime. And in the summertime, it gets well up into the 90s. So, and uh, we've got five fireplaces in the house, and we've only used one of them three times in the two years we've been there. So it, it's working very efficiently. We took an environmental problem, and we created an asset with it. And this is the kind of thinking that we've got to get into. We can solve the problems that we have environmentally. But you know, we've created them through this period we call the Industrial Revolution by developing the kind of technology that we enjoy today, our luxuries and our conveniences. But as Emerson said, there's a price on everything and the price for the Industrial Revolution is, uh, is very steep. It may, if we don't do something about it, if we continue the way we're going, it'll create an environment which does not support human life. So. Uh, that price uh, is there. Now, where, where was I going with that? I, uh, uh, anyway, the house is, uh, is working extremely well. I know I was going someplace with that. Any other question? Oh, I know what I was going to do. See, we've created the problems through our technology and through the development of that, but the real challenge of this decade is to use that same scientific knowledge and technology to no longer destroy or to endanger life with it, but to support life and to save and preserve life with it. And we can do it. There's no reason that we can't create an automobile that doesn't pollute. There's no reason why we can't get another energy source other than uh, that which pollutes. Uh, the, the, the technology is coming out of the woodwork. It comes across my desk all the time, so I know that it's there. And there's great hope that, that we can create the kinds of, of lifestyle that we're used to without it at the same time destroying the place that we live. Is there an, another question? Yes.
first of all, he said we're a very trashy society that recycling doesn't pay. And that is, 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 there's truth in that. And that's why all elements of our society must get involved in this problem. One, one element by itself cannot do it. We need, we need the recycling centers. Of course, we need the people that are willing to take the recyclable material to the center. Then we need the manufacturers that are willing to take that and to put it into a product that is economically feasible. And then we need uh, that to come back to the consumer and the consumer to buy it. In order for that to happen and to make it uh, uh, economically feasible, we also need help from our government. We need a government that is willing to uh, give people a tax break that want to get involved in this sort of activity, whether it be the ordinary citizen, the consumer, or whether it be the person that's going into business. We subsidize, as a government, all kinds of industries. We subsidize the lumber industry. We subsidize the beef industry. We subsidize the tobacco industry. Why can't we subsidize an industry that's going to save our ass? Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, the question was comment on the possibility of synergy among religious groups. Yeah, well, see, one thing about, I was trying to talk about spirituality without getting into religion because I think there are two different things. One is organized and one is an individual experience. And it doesn't make any difference what religion you might belong to. If you have the spiritual experience, that will tend to bring you together. That's, that's the uh, cement, if you will. That's the thread that ties us all together. Uh, and that's the important thing. And I, I don't know of any other way of doing it myself. Uh, I, I think it's important that you understand the concept of togetherness, that we must work together and that we are all uh, from the same source and no matter what religion that we might uh, follow and might be something that uh, is personally attractive to us, that behind all of those outward forms of religion is the one source, the one cause, the one creator. And if we can just hold that concept, I think that will help tie us together and bring us together in a closer, uh, closer way. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you heard from what, darling? Yeah. That's right. Recycled paper, paper does cost more, and that's one of the problems we have with it. And that's why those companies need a break from our government uh, tax-wise so it will reduce the cost and make it economically feasible. We have got to use the, do the power of the dollar to solve some of our environmental problems. If we don't get business involved in, in environmental problems, uh, we're not going to make it because there is a tremendous power in the power of the dollar. And also that goes with the consumer. You see, the consumer has a tremendous power with the way they spend the dollar because every dollar that is spent becomes part of the market forces out there and market forces can absolutely solve some of the environmental problems that our government seems very reluctant to address. We have a great power with the way we spend our money. Another question? Yes. Am I working with uh, Congress. Well, what I do is every time a bill comes up that is meaningful for the environment and that I, that I feel I want to support, I write. The power of the pen is tremendous. And you write your congressperson, you write your senator, you write the president, let them know how you feel because every letter that you write represents to them like I don't know. It, it's 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 a lot more than just the one letter. It's like 
into the thousands. They say this letter represents a thousand people who feel the same way. So you become not just one person, but like a thousand. So I, I know that after the Gulf War that I thought, well, here it's obvious to me that we must be for various reasons, for our own national defense, for our own uh, uh, personal lifestyle, for all of the reasons that seem so obvious to me, we need to be independent of foreign oil. We need to develop alternative energy sources. We need to develop, for instance, uh, natural gas, which we have plenty of here in the United States, which is less polluting. It's not perfect, but it's less polluting than petroleum. And we need to develop those things. And we need a national energy policy which addresses those. But the energy policy that was put forward by the administration was simply, let's dig for more oil. Basically, that's what it was about. And they ignored the fact that we have alternative energy sources, renewable and cheaper energy sources, energy sources that will create jobs and stimulate our economy, such as uh, sun and wind and hydroelectric and uh, moving water, all those things. And they're there, and it seems so obvious to me that that's what we should be focusing on and concentrating on, but we have failed to do it. But we need people to address these questions to their representatives and say, this is what we want. This is our future. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Well, he should be applauded then. You know, you should write him and pat him on the back and let him know that he has support out here. <clears throat> That's the way we're going to get the changes that we need. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you speak a little louder? I'm oh, yeah. Well, again, we, the, the Earth's natural life cycle will go on and on and on, but it just may go on without us. That's the thing. That's the problem because we, we are doing those things which undermine the kind of life supports that we need to live. And, you know, some scientists are saying we have 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to do something to turn it around or it's too late. We've gone beyond the point of no return. We don't know for sure, I don't know for sure, but I do know that the direction that we're going is not going to be very long. If you just look back uh, over the last hundred years, think back what's happened over the last hundred years. Uh, we didn't have, uh, we, we, we've created some real goodies like airplanes and television and compact discs and <coughs> computers and on and on and on. And we didn't have any of that stuff a hundred years ago. But we also didn't have some other things. We didn't have acid rain, deforestation, desertification. The ozone layer wasn't being depleted. Every time NASA goes up and takes another reading on the ozone hole, it gets bigger and bigger. So we're going in the wrong direction. So we've got to turn it around. And one of the things that will help us is developing the kind of technology that is not damaging and abusive to the environment. And we can do that. If we don't have the sense to do that, and at the same time create a sound, a strong, viable economy, then perhaps we should join the dinosaurs. Surely we can do that. Yeah. Wake up call when? Oh, I thought you wanted to know what my wake-up call was this morning. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the house, <laughs> you know, it's like any other building. You can put in it what you want to put in it. And in our case, we put in more than I wanted to put in it. 
but uh, uh, the house cost actually $100 a square foot. But what happened is we kept expanding it and we kept correcting. We kept going back and saying, no, no, this is, we want to do it this way and, and changing things. And once you start changing things, the price escalates. My, <clears throat> my son just built his house, same principle. And uh, I think it's going to run about $65 a square foot. But when you get through, you have no heating bill. You have no electric bill. He doesn't even have a water bill because all of the water that he uses in his house, he catches off of his roof and stores in a 3,000-gallon stainless steel tank, much like a cistern that we used to use in, uh, in Missouri when I was a kid. What was my wake-up call for the environment? Well, it's interesting. I was talking about that to somebody today, and when you get involved in a, in a problem or a social problem, you begin to realize that they're all connected in a sense. I first got started with the uh, problem of hunger in Los Angeles. Every urban city has a lot of hungry people and a lot of homeless people, and we my wife and I realized also that the supermarkets were throwing away a lot of food that was very nutritious and very edible, but it was food that had to be taken off the shelf because it was dated. And uh, we, we put together a delivery system which delivered this food to the people that were hungry in Los Angeles. And the program is called Life. Love is feeding everyone. And... Uh, we started out very modestly, feeding 400 people but a week, but because we had a viable program and because there was interest from the corporate community and from the business community, from service organizations and just from volunteers, just individuals, that uh, we have grown now to where we're feeding over 100,000 people a week. So uh, that uh, awareness of the hunger problem also made me aware that without an environment, the hunger is going to get worse. If we don't have the means to grow food, particularly with the population explosion, that it's just going to get worse. So they're all connected. And when you looked at, at uh, Africa and the famines that were going on there and there's going on again, and you realize that one of the main reasons is because that the, a major part of Africa has become desert and will not grow food anymore, uh, you realize that the environment is very critical to ending hunger. So that's how I, that was my my wake up call really began when they started when I started to realize from the scientific community that the ozone layer was being destroyed, and the realization that that is what allows life to exist on the planet. For those of you, I'm sure you know, but I'll tell you anyway. The ozone layer is that protective shield around the earth which filters out those deadly ultraviolet rays from the sun and allows life to exist here. We, there would be no life without that ozone layer. And we're destroying it. There's a hole in it at the South Pole that's far bigger than the United States and it's growing all the time. And they're really feeling the effects of it in Aust Australia where skin cancer has jumped by leaps and bounds. And we're being threatened here with a thinning ozone layer. So, uh, you know, we really got to do something about it. That's, is that it? Yeah. Well, I, I think anything having to do with the environment would be an excellent uh, project, whether it's recycling and trying to stimulate business and finding out what the problems are in recycling, reusing. Uh, education is a, is a great thing, uh, just to reduce the amount of energy that is used because it's the energy that we use that creates the problems, creates the gases, that creates the uh, greenhouse effect or that creates acid rain. <clears throat> All of that comes from the energy that we use, and if we just get in the habit of conserving, it would help a lot. If when we left a room, we'd turn off the light switch. If we would buy, uh, 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 an, uh, what am I trying to think of? Uh, 
uh, any kind of, of thing in the house that you use, uh, God, my mind, <laughs> anyway, like a, a, a shaver, a blender, a appliance. Thank you, Lord. Appliance. <laughs> a, any kind of appliance that conserves energy, you see, would be very helpful. It would also stimulate that industry and give those people that manufacture them a break. We've got to get that circle started. So education is, is a vital thing in this, this whole idea of, uh, of saving our environment. I think that would be tremendous. But, of course, uh, feeding people is also important. You know, yes. A vegetarian, how does that apply to the environment? Oh, this is the last question. I could tell him the look in his eyes. This was the last question. Well, I don't talk about that a lot because I don't like to make people angry, you know, but I will risk it. We're absolutely, in many ways, eating up our environment, eating up our, uh, uh, the, the, our ability to, to live here because when you consider the population explosion uh, and you consider the shortage of food, that you got to say, what is the most efficient way of feeding people? And for instance, it takes, where I come from in Colorado, water is a very important thing. And it takes about 22 pounds or 22 gallons rather, 22 gallons of water to create a, a pound of tomatoes, okay, to grow it. To create a pound of beef, it takes about 5,000 gallons of water. If, if you're talking about land, you can grow about uh, 25,000 pounds of potatoes on the same land that you can grow about 600 pounds of beef. So from that standpoint, it, it's, it doesn't, uh, leaning towards vegetarianism means a lot. Now, I don't mean for people to cut out what they're used to eating, but I would suggest that you think about reducing, just reducing and leaning in the direction of, the, of vegetarianism. Because also, every study that has come out recently will tell us that it's better for your health. That uh, heart problems, cancer problems, etc., are much lower in those countries where they're on a low meat diet and a high fiber diet and a high uh, carbohydrate diet. So, yeah, it's, it's... And also, when you're talking about the rainforest, most of the clearing of the rainforest was to grow beef so we could have hamburgers. That's mostly what it was for. And, uh, you know, every, every time you eat a hamburger, you can say, well, there goes another 60 square feet of rainforest. And they're cutting it down at the rate of one acre per second or one football field per second. So, you know, we gotta, we got to use, again, our buying power as a consumer and help solve some of these problems. Thank you. The environmental movement seems to to appear like waves in the ocean. You know, there's there's uh, peaks and valleys throughout throughout history, and there was a peak of interest in the 1900s, and it decayed for a while. There was another peak of interest in the 30s, late 30s, and down. We had a great peak of interest in the late 60s, early 70s, and during the 80s, uh, not much happened. But now we're beginning to observe a. Uh, a return to a, to a peaking of public environmental interest. One of the things that's, that's different this time is that uh, one can't help but notice how uh, entertainers, actors and actresses have taken uh, up the environment as a, as a major cause. And I wonder if you had any thoughts or you could reflect on that um, from a perspective of someone in that profession. 
You know, that, that's not really uh, surprising to me because historically I think you'll find that people in the creative fields, whether it be acting or uh, music, uh, dance, sculpting, whatever it might be, painting, uh, they've always uh, had a fairly high social consciousness. And it is true that um, they're attracted from one social cause to another. Uh, for instance, they've been involved very heavily in uh, the issue of hunger, the issue of peace around the world. And right now, uh, certainly they're involved in, in our health too. They're much, very much involved in the AIDS problem uh, that faces the world, but the environment uh, has attracted them a great deal also because it perhaps is the most critical issue that we face, and I think they understand that because if we don't uh, solve our environmental problems, if we destroy that which allows us to live here, then all the other issues are moot, really. It doesn't, it won't make any difference uh, whether we balance the budget or whether we have a deficit or whether uh, we have an increase or a decrease in taxes or the interest rates go down or hunger, is, uh, n crime, homelessness, none of these issues will matter if uh, if there's not a sustainable planet for human beings to live on, because all those issues will disappear because there won't be any humans. So I guess maybe, maybe that's the answer. You know, the, let, uh, let the environment deteriorate and then we won't have to bother with, uh, we'll just join the dinosaurs and, and not have to bother with those other issues. Uh, you mentioned last night that your interest in the environment came first through your uh, uh, concern with uh, hunger uh, as a as an issue, um, would you like to talk say some things about about the hunger project and how that really in some detail led you to to the environmental concern? Well, hunger was a hot issue in the early '80s because of uh, the media's attention to the problem in Africa, basically, and the famine that was going on there, and that led a lot of us to to examine our own society. And we realized that a lot of people were uh, hungry here. The, we had created what we called the new poor and people were sleeping in their cars, whole families. And we also knew that we were, uh, we were a, a wasteful uh, nation in that supermarkets were throwing away a lot of good, edible, nutritious food because it was dated and had to be taken off the shelves. But nevertheless, it was still good. And most of us would have that food past the, uh, the date on it in our icebox and, and would obviously eat it. And we just tried to figure out a way to create a distribution system to get that food to those that were in need. And that's what we basically did. Uh, we started out very modestly, feeding about 400 people, but because we got help from a lot of elements of the community, corporate uh, part and the business part, and uh, uh, the um, volunteers of individuals and uh, service groups of all kinds joined with us, and we are now feeding over 100,000 people a week. So. Uh, that issue of hunger made me realize that a lot of the issues that we're facing, that we're talking about, are connected. They're not isolated. And the environment became very strong in, uh, in our awareness simply because uh, if you don't have a, a place that grows food uh, abundantly and nutritious food, of course, uh, with a population explosion, you're going to have a hunger problem. And we saw it in, in the, particularly in Africa where the environment was being destroyed and many parts of Africa uh, were becoming uh, uh, desert. And we saw that those two issues were related very, very vividly. So uh, yes, the hunger issue did uh, 
take me into the environmental issue. Well, one of the questions that uh, spokesmen for the environment al always get, um, whether you're a teacher or, or someone who's speaking out public in these things, are people want to know uh, what, what uh, adjustments or changes you made in your personal life to, to try to compensate for this. And obviously your efforts for hunger are one. You will talk about your house in a second. But do you have any other uh, examples you could give us of changes or adjustments you've made personally to try to accommodate a more environmentally sound lifestyle? Yeah, well, that's, that's a really a good question because it's important that uh, as we, as the young people say, you got to walk your talk. It doesn't do any good to just tell people this is what they should do. That's not a uh, doesn't have much influence. As somebody said, example is not uh, only the best teacher, it's really the only teacher. And I, 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 I rather believe that, and I've tried to incorporate that philosophy in my own life. One of the things that I did was uh, I bought an electric car because I think we've got to make the transition over to uh, some kind of energy or some kind of fuel that doesn't pollute to serve our transportation needs. And I also uh, became involved in uh, a number of environmental groups and supported them not only with my time and, uh, and my thoughts and whatever, but also with uh, money because I think money is energy and I think we've got to put that energy to work. Uh, also, uh, in our own house, we, we tried to get uh, energy efficient, uh, uh, whether it be uh, with the use of water or whether it be with the use of electricity. We tried to get uh, energy efficient appliances in our house, and we used such things as compact fluorescent light bulbs. We used recycled material wherever we can. The stationery is all recycled paper. Uh, toilet tissue is recycled. Uh, uh, we, we try as a consumer to support the recycling industry, and I think that's important for all of us uh, to do that. So wherever we can, we try as a consumer to, to get recycled material, use it, and, and to buy those energy efficient items. I'm fascinated by your house uh, that we've that excuse me did yeah. I mention compact fluorescent light yes, bulbs yeah. I did okay. okay because that's really important you're uh, uh, just within the last two weeks the uh, PBS program about your house has been shown on the local uh, PBS station here and I'm really fascinated by it myself but could you explain the technique in detail and and uh, mentioned, you know, I know I know other houses have been built. This architect has, has built mm -hmm. other houses. And just talk a little bit in det detail about that. Uh, before I do that, you say it has been shown yes. on PBS here? Yes, about oh. two weeks ago. <clears throat> no, that's, well, a lot of people have been asking me if it could be shown here, and uh, I, evidently they missed it. <laughs> well, our, our library has uh, taped, you know, there's that sort of copyright. So I actually used it in my class before that 10 days mm -hmm. expired, and now mm -hmm. they keep it for 45 days, and well. they either buy it or... Uh, oh, I see. Okay, uh, well, we, we decided that we would try to create an independent, sustainable living space. Uh, I just thought that would be a neat thing to have, where you didn't have to depend upon the electric company, or you didn't have to depend on water company and you could uh, somewhat decrease your dependency on the supermarket, a place where we could grow food. So we luckily came across uh, an architect, his name is Michael Reynolds, that builds uh, solar mass houses. Now most people understand rather clearly what an, uh, a solar house is. There's quite a few of them around the country. Obviously, you take the sun's energy, and through photovoltaic cells, you convert that energy into electricity. We store it in batteries, and then uh, all of that uh, electricity that's in the batteries is used to power all of our appliances in the house, whether it be the washing machine or the refrigerator or the dishwasher, hair dryer, shaver, whatever it is. All of those appliances are... are uh, 
they are powered by a clean, inexhaustible source of energy, which is the sun. Now, what's interesting about this house really is the mass part, because mass has the ability to store temperature or to store energy. So we wanted to put mass in the house. Now, to create that, we also took uh, an environmental problem and made it an asset. We took used automobile tires, which uh, uh, are, we're really trying to figure out what to do with them. Uh, we throw away 240 million of them a year as Americans. And if they catch fire, of course, uh, it's a real, a real uh, environmental problem. They're very toxic. The last fire, uh, last pile of tires that caught on fire, uh, it was in Canada. They had to ex uh, evacuate about uh, 20,000 people in that neighborhood. So it's a real environmental problem, but they're also indestructible. You put them in a landfill and they, they never deteriorate. So landfills, for the most part, won't take them anymore. So we thought, well, if they don't deteriorate, that'd make a really a good building substance because they'd last forever, and that's exactly true. And what we did was we pounded or rammed dirt into the tires until the tires become uh, tire bricks. They swell up. They weigh about 400 pounds a piece when we're finished, and then we use these tire bricks as you would ordinary bricks to build the walls of the house. So every living space in the house is surrounded by this huge amount of mass created by rammed dirt in these used automobile tires. What this allows us to do is to have no heating ducts or no air conditioning because the house becomes a giant thermal battery and it sort of heats and cools itself, just much like a cave does. If you've ever gone down in a cave, you know that it's cool in the summertime and it's warm in the wintertime. This, uh, is what happens to our house, basically. It, it tends to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And we have um, pretty severe weather out there. It gets down to 30 below in Colorado and in the summertime it gets well up in the 90s. And uh, we, we have no heating ducts, as I said, or no air conditioning. We only have uh, a fireplace and in the two and a half years that we have lived out there, we've had the fireplace on three times. So the house is working beautifully in terms of heating and cooling itself. Also, uh, you know, you have no electric bill at the end of the month, and you have no heating bill. So uh, over a period of time, it begins to pay for itself. There's also a space in the house along where the windows are, close to the windows, which is really warm because the, the sun is directly hitting that spot. So we don't use that area for living space. What we did is we put in about a two-foot planter in that area. And uh, all across the south, southern part of the house, uh, we have these planters. And we grow everything in the house. Uh, well, not everything, but uh, many things. We grow a tremendous amount of tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, uh, eggplant, all kinds of, um, um, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> I started to say spices, but that's not it. We have things like uh, um, uh, what do you, basil. Herbs, yeah, you make, like basil, that you make pesto sauce out of, and it's, it's really terrific. Uh, we we're growing grapes in the house. So there's a lot of things we're going to experiment with in the future and, and try other things uh, and see just what will grow there, but it's, it's an exciting experiment. Well, how difficult did you find it to buy uh, appliances and that sort of thing that were energy efficient? What's the market like for that? Well, you can't go into just any store and buy these energy efficient appliances, but there's a lot of uh, uh, catalog uh, type stores that uh, are selling them and you, you can get them, they're available. There's a place, there's a, a, a store called Seventh Generation that puts out a catalog that you can, uh, you can get all of these appliances from. And you can get DC appliances. 
uh, from these catalogs more and more. I know my son who just finished his house, he was showing me a catalog just the other day and he was showing me all the different things that they're coming up with that are really new right now that are powered by DC current. So uh, you don't have to have the inverter. You, you know, the, the sun, when, when that energy is converted into electricity, it's DC current. And to use it on, on your alternating current system, you have to have an inverter to invert it. But uh, with the appliances now that are coming out, uh, that will no longer be the case. And what is exciting about this is, again, we're seeing an environmental industry developing. And we're seeing an economy that is based upon environmentally correct items that's happening. And we're seeing that jobs are being created through uh, saving the planet, if you will. No catalog, uh, real goods is another catalog. Real goods is another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. What, uh, nothing's perfect. You've been in the house, you said, for, t for uh, two years, but mm -hmm. is, are there things you would, uh, just you could tell us about that you might change or modify oh. or? Re oh, re ab absolutely. You know, this is in an evolutionary process right now. And uh, if we had waited until it was perfect, we would have never built the house. So you just got to bite the bullet and say, okay, we're going to run with what is now available to us. There, there are a number of things, and I, I don't know that I can explain them in detail. Uh, for instance, uh, the windows that we used, we, you need to get air in the house. You need to uh, vent it so that uh, the warm air in the summertime can be taken out through skylights because uh, the warm air rises, so you want skylights at the top. But the windows at the bottom, uh, for instance, we would do differently now. Uh, because the windows we have that are functional, that operate, uh, would, uh, they have a tendency to cut off the solar gain. They're more expensive and they also cut off the view. So what we do now is we put the windows in down lower so that they're just vents. They're not uh, windows as we conventionally think of a window. So there's a lot of different things that we would, uh, we would do differently now. They're doing trusses, uh, a, 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 a structure on the roof, which is different than what we did. We used logs or beetle kill, dead standing uh, logs, or we call them vegas. But uh, a more inexpensive way is to use the trusses. And you can also, by doing that, create a greater R factor in the roof. You can get an R factor of about 100 now. Ours is only about 60. Uh, I'd like to come back to the, the hunger question a minute again, because these are these are problems again. It just these are questions that vex everybody mm -hmm. that tries to deal with environmental problems. But um, one of the paradoxes we always face uh, with uh, when we address the issue of hunger and environment is the the idea of hunger, environment, economic growth. Are how can those be compatible in in any way? Uh, not not just in the U.S. but in uh, in developing countries as well. I mean, uh, you know, one of the sol solutions we've always thought to uh, world hunger and, and poverty has been economic growth, but that has deleterious impacts on the environment. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we get out of that mix? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I don't claim to have any final answers on everything because this is a very complex problem, but there are some basic truths involved in this. and. Uh, one is that uh, wherever you find hunger, you will find environmental deterioration. People have an urge to live. They have a will to live, and they will do anything to satisfy their hunger. And if that means destroying their environment, they will do it to satisfy hunger. So if it's a, a poor country, has an economic problem, the tendency is to destroy the, the environment. And when you destroy the environment, you also destroy your economic base. The environment is the economic base for all economies uh, throughout history. So you get into a vicious cycle of hunger, destruction of the environment, and a destruction of the economic base, which destroys jobs, which creates hunger again, which has a tendency to destroy the environment. So what we've got to do is break that vicious, ugly cycle. 
And uh, you, you've got to introduce the kind of sustainable industries and a sustainable economy that doesn't destroy the environment. That's the big challenge that we have in this decade. And I maintain that there's an environmental industry or an industry which is not uh, destructive to our environment that is just waiting to be tapped, whether it be in the field of energy or, or fuel or whether it be uh, in other areas of growing food without uh, uh, destroying the soil with a lot of pesticides and herbicides and, uh, and uh, chemicals and different things like that. We've also got to think about shifting away uh, of our dependency on, on uh, meat as our basic uh, food supply because the, uh, the earth is being destroyed somewhat by that particular industry. Uh, so it's, it's a big challenge, but I think it's one that we can meet if we understand the problem and if we come together with, uh, in an idea of, of cooperation with those uh, countries that are uh, more economically uh, hurting. I think a step in that right direction was the Earth Summit that we experienced in Rio. And I think from that, we've got to use that as a base and we've got to grow from that. And uh, it's going to be a very exciting uh, period, I think, for human beings. Uh, it's a very challenging one, but I think it's one that offers us a great deal of excitement and a great deal of opportunity. In your, uh, it, it's obvious in listening to your talks and uh, your programs that uh, you talk about spiritual change, individual change, and that sort of thing, and, and you say you don't like the word uh, religious because that in some ways tends to be divisive, but could you uh, spend a few minutes and, and uh, talk to us, sort of clarify that, that dilemma between the spiritual and the religious um, uh, world? I mean, there's mm -hmm. a... Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Historically, I think religion has had a tendency to uh, control people, basically. Uh, it's, it's been an organizational, uh, uh, you know, it's really difficult for me to talk about this because I don't want to really, uh, I'm very sensitive to people that uh, uh, have found some solace in their religion and that uh, are comforted by that. And uh, I don't want to destroy that at all. I'm not trying to do that. But what I, I think I'm trying to point out is that people uh, become religious or they join different religions for various reasons. And usually they're the wrong reason. They, they join a church or a temple or a synagogue for political reasons or social reasons or, uh, or business reasons. But... Uh, that has nothing to do with spiritual growth. To me, spiritual growth is an individual thing. It doesn't matter what religion we belong to. If, if we can uh, understand that there is a consciousness within us that is not conditioned by outward things, has nothing to do with outward things, is not affected by outward things, and it's uh, a consciousness that uh, really always was and always will be. It's what I like to call uh, our eternal self. Uh, and the nature of that is very peaceful and very blissful, very joyful. And that is not only in each one of us, but it is contactable by each and every one of us. And when we contact that in the stillness within, then that begins to affect everything that we do in outward consciousness. And that's why it's so important. Uh, when you have a feeling of joy and peace and uh, love within yourself and you experience that, you automatically reflect those feelings in your outward actions and your actions become kinder and more compassionate and more understanding and of course more tolerant and really uh, wiser. Uh, so, uh, 
to me, that is the key of this transitional period that we're, we're going into is for us to more and more shift uh, our consciousness or the emphasis of it away from material things to the spirit within. And it's like, it's like um, Albert Schweitzer said that the disastrous feature of our civilization is that we have developed more materially than we have spiritually. And that uh, our, the balance has been disturbed and that a nation or a civilization that develops more on the material side or only on the material side and not in the sphere of spirit heads for disaster. And I believe the opposite is true. The more we develop spiritually, uh, the more we go towards uh, the solutions to our problem and to victory. What would you say uh, to uh, agnostics, uh, other than come on in? I mean, what, what kind agnostics, of message? Agnostics, uh, you know, agnostics are probably closer in many cases to that uh, spirit within than uh, some so-called religious people because Agnostics uh, are using the power of the intellect uh, that we have been given, and they are seeing that religion, in, in following just the outward form of religion, is uh, sometimes uh, very destructive and is not very meaningful. Uh, and they're saying, if that is what spirituality is all about, I don't really believe... Uh, that I want to bother with that. But an agnostic uh, whether, or an atheist, whether they know it or not, has that same center within them, the same consciousness of peace and bliss, and it's beyond the restlessness of the mind, it's beyond the activity of this world, and, and it's there, and it's available to them just like it is to anyone else, and it will affect them uh, in a very positive way once they experience it, just like uh, it will anybody else. We're all the same in that respect. We all have the same basic foundation or the same basic core, the same center, and that's what ties us all together. That's the thread that unifies us. And that's the realization or the consciousness that the world needs and that we need to come to and that is the consciousness that will solve every problem that we have, whether it be political or social or environmental or economical. Or It'll solve all problems if we just utilize it. We've got this portable heaven that we're carrying around with us and we're living in ignorance of it. And ignorance is a source of our, it's, it's, uh, ignorance is a source of our greatest problem. So if we could just wipe away the ignorance of our soul, if you will, or the ignorance of that consciousness within us, uh, you will see great changes happening in the world and very, very quickly. Well, the, the world has come a long way since uh, the, the gun smoke days, and you've come a long way. What, any, anything with regard to the environment? We can eat. What's next for Dennis Weaver with regard to the environment? Uh, any, any new things out there, or are you just going to keep plugging away? I, I think I'm just going to keep plugging away and see what happens. I know that there's something out there, but the wonderful part of this life, of this drama of, of uh, the cosmos, if you will, is that you don't know what's around the next corner, and that's what makes it wonderful. If we knew, if it was predictable, it would get pretty dull and boring, and boring is the worst thing. So. I don't know exactly. I know I'm just going to keep following my conscience and uh, plugging away, as you say. And I must say that in the last five years, my life has changed considerably and it's become much more fulfilling and much more exciting. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Dennis. You bet.